Yeah. Good evening, business links. We have with us, as we promised, Mr. Sam Dodu, who is an assistant commissioner at GRA based in Kumasi, GRA being Ghana Revenue Authority. You may recall that Sam was with us two weeks ago for our Ghana Beyond the Eight session. Um, but this evening's session is his area of expertise. So it promises to be a very interesting one indeed. Welcome, Sam, yet again. Yeah. Thank you. Good, Sam. So we go straight to the first question, which is this. We keep getting told that our tax slash GDP is below our peer group. Do we add the de facto tax we place on cocoa farmers in calculating the tax take? Thank you. No, tax does not include cocoa receipts. But GRA does not, and by law, not allowed to tax cocoa revenue of cocoa farmers. That's uh, section 71J of the Income Tax Act 896, 2015. Uh, GRA does not tax cocoa, the income from cocoa of cocoa farmers. So basically, um, tax revenue includes uh, CIT, which is uh, company income tax, personal income tax, VAT, custom duties, excise, etc., etc. Cocoa revenue is a non-tax revenue that goes straight to the Ministry of Finance. And they pay the cocoa farmer approximately 70% of the world market price per ton. And um, the other 30%, they take what they take cocoa duties. And then the rest is used by the cocoa board to finance its administration, cocoa spraying, uh, farmers' children's scholarships, uh, extension services to farmers, subsidizing cocoa fertilizers, and constructing cocoa roads, etc., etc. So specifically, cocoa is not part of our tax uh, to the GDP ratio as measured in Ghana. So when um, the income from cocoa is taxed, it goes back to the cocoa farmers and it goes back to supporting the, 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 that, that area. Mm -hmm. so the, the, the 70% of the, of, the, of the price per ton per, at, at the world market is given to cocoa farmers. And the other percent Ministry of Finance take it used to be 10% or something, the cocoa duty. But it varies according to each year, according to how they calculate, per the dollar rate, whatever. The, 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 the money they take, the cocoa duty is separate. But it's not included in our tax, our tax GDP computation. Okay. Then the rest of administrative expenses and all that. Yeah. So what you're saying is that it goes back straight into the community, into, the, into that sector, whether it be administration, fertilizers, farmers in control go straight back in. Precisely so. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is, businesses are supposed to collect VAT on behalf of the GRE. When business that is the next collector, it's supposed to pay. When it's a net receiver, it's supposed to be paid the next. However, in Ghana, when the GRA owes a business but they don't pay you, um, but they ask you to put it towards your tax credit. The next effect of this is that businesses end up funding the state and it's an unfair burden on them. Does GRA intend to address this issue? What happens is um, VAT rates are normally classified under uh, the VAT flat rate scheme that's at 3%. The zero rate scheme, which is for exporters. And then the standard rate at 12.5% for man, mainly for manufacturers and service providers. And uh, the difference between the input and output is what the, uh, the net figure is what is paid over to the GRE. When it's a carry, to carry it forward against the subsequent month. Now, um, some, what happens is if the taxpayer stocks, which is mainly their inputs, goes higher, they have a credit. When the sales go higher than the stocks, they have a and it, it, it varies from month to month. So it, it will be very absurd if you tell them every month, come for money, pay money. It, 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 the, the, the tax office will be flooded with a lot of confusion. 
So basically, what we do is we allow them to rule it over because invariably it, it irons itself out in the subsequent months. So it's essentially, it's easier that way than to tell. So essentially, this is easier this way. It makes things more manageable. That's what yes, you're saying. Yes. Yes, please. So straight on to the third question. What's the reason behind asking businesses to do a self-assessment estimate? Well, uh, if you look at the the big countries, advanced countries like the US, UK, and others, the self-assessment is a norm. I mean, it's a modern form of taxation. And a lot of uh, businesses currently, especially the, the, the large and the medium ones, have any employment accountants and, and tax consultants. So it's easy for them to assess themselves. Then at the, at the end of the year, we'll compare it to see the difference. So uh, self-assessment is to enhance and facilitate voluntary compliance. So people voluntarily assess themselves and tell us the truth. If it's not the truth, we end up penalizing them. I mean, how do you know it's not the truth? How do you determine what their real um, income we, is? We, we go for audits. We go for audit, or even when they submit their assessments, you realize that there's a difference. You can, on the face of the accounts, you can even assess the difference between what has been bought and what they actually declared at the beginning of the year. In fact, they have several times across the year to change, I mean, to amend it as they go along. If at the beginning of the year, you say yeah, the income will be 100,000, and then I realize that uh, the econo your economy is improved, the, the business is doing well, you can shift it along the side. But if you don't around the year and we net off the other one, you are in trouble, you pay the penalty thereof. There's a formula for calculating the penalty thereof. The fourth question is... So people are allowed to bring... Okay. I'm listening, please. You know, so go on, you're, you're trying to, you're going to conclude it. You're going to I'm conclude listening. it. Ah, uh, sorry. I lost it. Let's go on. <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. sorry let's go. Uh -huh. The next question is, what concrete plans and timeline does the GRA have to, number one, enable small businesses to submit their monthly VAT returns electronic, electronically via online portal, for example, Express Pay? And number two, to enable small businesses to, do, to instantly and electronically pay their VAT every day. Um, this, this is called e filing and e pay. That's electronic filing, electronic pay. It's predominantly uh, practiced at the large tax pay office. You now, they are bigger companies with uh, of, uh, uh, good accountants and consultants, and things like that. So, it's easy for them to create or file online. But the smaller businesses uh, currently, um, uh, a software has been prepared for them. I knew last month, some people met somewhere in Pram Pram and they have gone back to the, to the Europe and they will come back. Some people are preparing the, the, the software and I'm sure very, very soon we will it out to cover the smaller companies so that they can file online and, and, and pay online. Some of them are ready to do that, so we should allow them to do it. As pertains to a lot of African countries. Interestingly, it was Ghanaians who went to set up those, those countries like East Africa, Uganda, Kenya, and others were set up by Ghanaians, and we are yet to do ours, but we'll do it. Well, so I say that it's been done in other parts of Africa, in East Africa. Yes. It's yes. it. I see. Yes. Tanzania, Zambia, and others are all doing it. Right. So some of them so are what, ahead so of us. So what's taking us? What are, why are we catching, catching up? The yeah. plane catch up are supposed to be in at the front. Very soon, catch up with them. Okay, I said, why are, we playing, why are we playing catch-up? political commitment is there. The political commitment is there, so they are pushing. Now we are digitizing everything. You know, the vice president is pushing everybody to digitize the economy. So we are pushing these things very, very fast. Okay. So what you're saying is that the larger um, companies are able to do it online? Yes. Okay. So we are just waiting for the smaller companies to be able to do that? Yeah. The next some, of the, some of them actually pay, some of them pay straight into their accounts, but filing online is what we are trying to so that we can do both. 
I but see. that's what we are trying to do. Okay. So, so, so I ask you a quick question. Okay. In regards to the larger companies, what facilities have they got that they, the smaller companies don't have? What's stopping them, smaller companies, from filing online like the larger companies do? Mm. <clears throat> Internet facilities, banking facilities, so many things. I mean, they have the necessary gadgets to work with, comparative to the smaller ones. So the software or to the help the smaller ones. Yes. So there's a facility available so for people to submit their taxes online. The only issue yes. is that some companies probably don't have internet access. Some don't have um, facilities such as computers. Is, is that the reason why they can actually submit their online um, assessment? Yes, please. Oh. yes, please. The smaller ones, most of them. Uh, so we have to find a way to help them to get it done. Right. Okay. So, so the the challenge is with the companies themselves and not with the government. Is that what you're saying? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. I have to come. The government has to meet them halfway so that it can facilitate everybody doing that. Okay. But what has the government or what has GRA itself done to help these smaller companies know that there's a facility available? You can go online, you can go to a library, you can go to an internet cafe to submit your um, tax return. Because if the big companies are able to use it, I'm not, I mean, for a business, um, it's more than likely that they are either not aware that there's a facility available, or an online facility available, or they uh, are aware of that they haven't made an effort to be able to submit it. And of course, if they're educated to let them know that this facility is available, it might make life easier for themselves, um, as well as your um, ERA. So what, um, what yeah, that's what has been done about that? The GRA is trying to roll out uh, a platform for them to use, to make it easier for them, even those who don't have. They have a way that they can do it, so that everybody can go online if you want. There should be a way for them to do it. For example, we put uh, the forms on it. I will push you, upload it, and fill it before they come. Some of them cannot. They still come to the for the forms. So, so people like that, you should teach them what to do. So it's, a, it's about education and it's about rolling up uh, a software for them to use, which will be easier understood from a simple man's angle. Oh, okay. Really man's angle. Oh. Are you ready for the next question then, Sam? Can you hear me, Sam? Yes, please, I'm listening. Okay. Is it possible to pay my VAT straight away as it comes in, as opposed to waiting for it to bulk up and then paying? Um, this would smooth out revenue inflows for GRA and make it easier for um, small and medium enterprises to keep up. Oh, yes. Um, the VAT Act at 870 uh, states, it states that you can pay on or before the end of the subsequent month. For example, if you collect VAT receipts in January, you're supposed to pay at the end of February, but you can pay on or before. Many times from 1st February to the end, you have the right to come and pay. Any time you have the right to come and pay. So the law says so the on is or before, which means that it's open up to the last day. So at any point in time, you can come and pay. And you are, in fact, we, we even like that, we get our money quicker for the state to use. So the facility is there, but maybe people don't know much about it. That's why this question has been asked. They do. They prefer to be the money to the last day. I mean, naturally, everybody wants to run, off his, run the money of his business until the last day before they come and pay over. People, okay, nice. they, so always the last day, the offices are full of people. I mean, Ghanaians by nature likes last meet. That's how we, the term they use. Oh, it's the same in so this People country. prefer coming on the free last day. But especially the banks, if, if the banks were running, they know in the bank, the, the cash, uh, the, the stock in trade is cash. So there's no way a banker will give you his money on the first of every month. It will always be the last day. After it has traded in the money for the whole month, then the last day before they come and pay. That's what most people prefer doing. Okay. But they are allowed on or before the date to come and pay. 
Okay. And what happens if they missed um, the payments a few days after? Are they in, in care? Do they in care a fine or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, you are you are charged penalty like five hundred cities for the first day. Every subsequent day, ten cities a day. And then if you delay, you can also file and not pay. If you don't pay, the money means that you are still keeping the money. So interest is accumulated on the money. There's a way of calculating the interest for keeping your check more uh, uh, later than the day that you're supposed to pay. So that becomes penalty plus interest. Okay. Yeah. I suppose that's the same way that it's done here. Um, Phil, what do you think? Um, yeah, it's similar. I mean, in the UK, um, we have to submit by the 31st of, um, I think, January. January. Um, if you haven't submitted, um, you also incur charges. I think it's £100, and then you yeah. pay interest uh, daily thereafter. So it's similar to what's happening in Ghana. And of course, that's the only way you can enforce um, these um, 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 taxes and VAT returns. If not, um, people just take advantage of it. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and there's also a, a race at the end of January. People faxing the, filing their tax returns right at the end of January. That's right. Yeah. Very right, similar to um, experience in Ghana. The rates are lower than when you pay. Is that it? That's right. Are you um, saying the rates are lower when you pay? Wow. That, 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 that's, no. that's, that's, that's a. a, 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 a maybe we have to think about that. No, it's not lower. It's like, no, because your, file, your tax returns are your tax returns. But if you don't file them in. Um, oh. at the, you have to, by the deadline, mm -hmm. then you get the penalties and the interest. But people normally wait and do mm -hmm. it before the deadline because that's just human yeah, nature. Yeah, yeah. The next question is, what are we yeah, doing? Human nature. Yeah. yeah, so there's no, there's no Africans, it's, it's everywhere. No, it's everywhere. That's everywhere. I mean, it's business. But and it's everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah, it's it's similar to what the explanation you gave, even the banks and the building societies, um, they all do the same thing. They wait to the last minute because they want to accrue more interest from their investments. So, um, yeah. Um, the next it's question is, right. yeah. what are we doing wrong that after 60 years of independence, we need consultants to help with our tax collection? Well, this oh, question is, is purely because we are looking at companies such as KPMG and the likes that would have to pay extra to, you know, use their expertise or ask for their expertise um, to be able to, you know, um, work with, um, the GRE work with. Um, of course, that increases the cost, the uh, administrational cost of running GRE. That is why it's quite an important question for, for, for the viewers. Oh, okay, I get you. But basically, here yeah, we are we work more with uh, uh, development partners and sponsors like Danida from Denmark, DFID from uh, Britain, that's the Department for International Development, and then GIZ, the Tanker Division of the German Brazil, and then Swiss government, amongst others. But, um, that's very dynamic, and uh, we still need those who are advanced at tax systems from the EEC and OECD countries to help us in benchmarking and to keep the international standards and best practices. So once in a while, they come in, they help us, they train us, uh, they sponsor, I mean, even financially, they sponsor, take some people out to go and learn. So that they want to bring information between the world. You know, once in a while, the EEC or something meet and they standardize a practice for all the EEC practice. OECD meet, they do some, some nothing. So it's like they're trying to do, to help all of us to, to work together, to unify to come into uh, our tax systems to a global world. I think that's basically why they're trying to help us. So we have all these sponsors and development partners who come in to come and help us. So we can modernize our tax system to suit the world environment. Because their companies also come and invest here. And naturally, they'll be paying taxes. And we have to find a way to work together. And that's basically why we have all these things coming in. So, I mean, how long do you expect them to be around for? Are you expecting it to be a long-term thing or just until our people are able to do it, we are able to do it ourselves? Yeah, until the time when they see uniformity across the world, I'm sure they'll keep on coming. They'll keep on helping. When you say, do you mean that until our practices are aligned with those of the, um, the West and other countries? I think so, basically. So, and once in a while, they introduce something. 
Nigerian cartel commerce. So generally, so we have to also, they, also learn, they also learn from us. Okay. Sometimes they learn from us. Yeah, interestingly, because I remember when we were in the, the Tass Academy in the UK, the Ethiopians brought out some models, and the, the British were interested that, wow, these ones we don't have, we want to introduce it into the transport sector. You know, and it's, it's nice. But sometimes they also want to learn it. But are so we... it's good that once a while we, as the learners, we also teach them a few things from us, and they also adapt it. But do we have, do we have, for example, a plan to win ourselves of this sponsorship and then do it independently of them? Or is it the case that we will always need them? Um, most of the time, we do most of the things ourselves. They only come in to help. Okay. They don't take center stage, no. We do most of the things ourselves. They only come in once a while to help. And to when, did few, come, uh, when did they come in? Did they come in when you um, basically you ask for their help, or do they come in when there's a restructuring or a view in the whole um, tax policy system internationally? Rice GRE has metamorphosed across the years. I mean, it was formerly central revenue department. It came to it became central revenue department before it became internal revenue service. Then later we have to merge. Then we create the VAT service. Then we have to make the VAT IRS and the SEFs. We create a complete service. I mean, HMRC has been through that line before. So they understand that when they rise, uh, we have a few problems. So we invite them and they take interest in helping us to streamline our similar. No, you, you also have the inland revenue and you have the emergency customs. Now they've merged into HMRC at your end. Similarly, it's the same thing. We have literally the whole Africa, everybody is trying to come together into that. You know, we have the Ethiopian uh, uh, Revenue Authority, Zambia Revenue Authority. All of them are coming together the, the same way. So sometimes a little technical advice from them help in shaping since they have taken the lead. Okay. That's why they help in shaping our, 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 our way forward. So the next question is, what's the, the great complexity or challenge around broadening the tax net base, the tax base? I think basically our challenge is mainly with the informal sector, which is said to form 70% of the economy. Record keeping is a big problem, actually, of them. It's difficult to assess them accurately. A lot of car transactions take place and they don't pass the banking system. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the education levels and the knowledge of tax affairs is a bit difficult. So working on them is a whole assignment. It's easy to deal with the, 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 the format, but the informal sector is more difficult to penetrate. Um, I would expect that, or I'll assume that this is um, the case for most African countries. Now, you have countries like Botswana yes. and Rwanda who are quite successful. Have you ever spoken to them or tried to engage with them and find out whether they have a way of dealing with this that is successful or, or that works? Because Sometimes I'm sure. They have I think they I love it. <laughs> the technical cooperation allows us to interact with some of those ones. People travel that with South Africa, Rwanda, Tanzania, Zambia, and others. We, we go there to learn from them and we also teach them. I mean, when it's nice, they also come here for training when they don't also understand a few things. We interact. And still, it's still difficult. Even, even in the advanced country, they still have a problem with the informal sector. It's not, it's not as easy as that. They all have to struggle to break through. But ours is 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 is, is overly in essence. And then because you are talking about that's where it's, but, but we are working about that. We are working on that. We are doing our best. I think last time I said that we are, have a problem with um, the work uh, number of workers. Now we have this Napo people. The government has given us this Napo people. A lot of graduates who are sitting in the house and we're not working for the past five years. Some of them have been brought in and have been trained to go to the field and. We intend to move them office to office, factory to factory, shop to shop, whatever, to see how best we can rope in as, many, as much as possible for the government. So I want to break through into the informal sector. So you're talking about also the the the, the tomato sell in the market. Are we talking about them as well? Yeah. We have various ways of handling those ones. I will come to that. But we are also trying to uh, teach them with bookkeeping, simple bookkeeping methods. We have we have uh, prepared handouts. So they can keep their books for us to monitor. 
so they can present to us every year as their accounts. They don't necessarily go for some of them say they can't pay it, so I can't to pay the accounts for them. So definitely you have to find a way to help them. So similar, we have handouts and we are trying to pay simple, uh, uh, simple income and expenditure books and pamphlets and things like that for them to keep it. I mean daily, so at the end of the year they can come up with something more reasonable for us to assess them properly. Some so would you then? So do they have like a tax base? A minimum, um, you have to make a certain amount before you start paying tax on it, like here. So you'd work out um, how much income they would have to have yes. paid before they start paying tax. Yes. We'll do that. Yes, there's, there's, always, there's, always, there's always a minimum where you not cross over. So basically here we have, um, we deal with people who have, um, and that's the, but the second cell of the act, we have a provision, provision made for uh, a new type of task called presumptive tax. That's those who earn between 20,000 to 120,000 a year. They pay about 3%. We have the market women, the pure market, those the one sellers and other sellers, the small, small ones, mm -hmm. who pay what they call tax stamp. Mm -hmm. That one is a, it's a sticker. That is affixed to your, uh, your, your doorstep or your table or something per quarter. You pay once a quarter. Then they will affix it so that when we can renew. And every quarter we change the color so that you will not we, we can identify those who have paid and those, those who have not paid. So we, we stick those uh, uh, um, tax stamps at as you pay, we stick it on the doors across the country so that we can rope in a little from all those ones. Then we go down to the car uh, drivers, those are what we call vehicle income tax. You see, and they, they also pay. Um, some small figure, some nominal amount per quarter. And the sticker is pasted on their cars. So once the police sees it and you haven't got yours, then they can the police can arrest you. So they force you to go and pay at the income there, the tax office. I see. So this means that the market sellers are being taxed irrespective of how much income they make. Yes, they are. Yes, is that fair? Yes, they are. They are. Is that fair? The tax term. Is that fair? What, what what you actually what you actually pay is actually uh, insignificant right but at least it's something so they are comfortable with so that yes yes and they are proper at least everybody must contribute something towards it and they're proper oh, proper yes. account, proper account state of all of, of all the monies coming yes. in yeah because uh, the stickers are, are are numbered and properly accounted for from the office Responsible officers are sent to the to the field to do that. I mean, so because as long as there's no element for corruption in that sector, then you'll be assured that you'll get some income coming in. But if people are able to manipulate it, then it means that the income will come but will not go into the relevant into the proper coffers, it will go into some other people's pockets. No, they are accounted for. They are accounted for just as market women, most of them will dodge. They keep on changing their positions. <laughs> keep on moving. They don't have permanent places. Okay, that's a challenge. That's 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 difficult to deal with. Yeah. Um, Sometimes we group them into various uh, associations, like maybe a uh, dress sellers association, tomato sellers association, cooking intensive sellers association. Sometimes we group them to association so that association leaders will check their members. That also helps once in a while. Okay. Because most people in the Ghana market, most people would like to center around a similar place. Like if you go to Ghana, to those all of them are uh, uh, second-hand clothes sellers. If you go to a particular place, uh, new time you see all the printing presses along the same line. Mm -hmm. Some of them like to uh, station themselves around the same area. So it's easy to have their leader monitor it for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I guess sometimes too, if for example you have your 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 clients know that you're in a particular area, you want to stay there because if you move, then you lose your clients, don't you? If you do what? For example, if sometimes it's better for you as a trader to, to stay in a particular area, because if you keep moving around, you lose your clients. Because if your, your clients yes, know yes, that yes. you are here, then they come and look for you. But if you, you leave, then you yes. lose them. So I think that the incentive yes, is more true. for them to stay in one place than to move around. Well, that's <laughs> so, but I see, there are a few itinerant ones. When they hear the task work coming, they'll still run away. I can't, I can't say I blame them. <laughs> <laughs> I remember back in the days when you see the peddlers on the roads, those that you sell things on the roads, 
And they said, oh, the tax man is coming. Then everybody picks their stuff and start running everywhere. <laughs> I understand why they do that. Um, this, this question number seven sort of fed into number eight. So you've more or less answered number eight, which was um, yes. what are the arguments against the flat tax, especially for market yeah, we've, more, we've more or less answered that question from yeah. number seven. Yeah. Unless there's anything else you want to add. Do you think the digital addressing system, um, once it's rolled up fully, would help, you know, because it looks like the issue or the main problem you have is the location the of... Address system. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yes, yes. Are you working... Are you are working still working? Pardon? Yes, yes, yes. But the problem is that but it's still not for the smaller traders. It's still for the bigger ones. You can use that for the bigger ones. They are, they are permanently stationed. Mm -hmm. So the traders are not, they are still mobile. I yeah. Yeah, they are. So they are just significant work on them. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think one of the main things that would probably help i don't know if it's not being done already is to find out what incentives that you probably will be able to give to the small traders something that will make them want to pay their taxes um are they aware of any incentives are they giving any incentives what um what's the deal in terms of them paying their taxes incentives are given to uh, organized groups the leaders for them to implement it how to call it to force their, their members to pay so what incentives are you giving the groups the particular, percentage, particular percentage is given to the leaders and that will motivate them to coerce their members or convince them to pay when they, when it's an organized group like chop bar sales association or whatever association and when there's a leader once you get some out of it you work you definitely go around on his members and make sure they pay the specific taxes so is that percentage going specifically for the leader or for the group? For the leadership, maybe to run the group or something. So they are comfortable with that. Once you get something to run, because leaving your work to go and organize something is so interesting. He's losing. So if you get getting nothing out of it, there's no way you, anybody will organize. Right. So when uh, they are motivated to organize their people, at least once you get something out of it, they're ready to mobilize them. Okay, and uh, is the leader nominated by the association of people or business? Yes, they themselves they organize themselves and choose their leaders. The the most vocal ones and the most uh, those who can organize them and those who can influence others to follow them. And are they aware that the leader has a, a percentage discount? <laughs> well, I'm not too sure of that. Okay. Okay. I'm not too sure of that. Yeah, probably not. Because <laughs> I don't think that it's in the leader's mm -hmm. interest to divulge the fact that they, 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 he's being given for their heads. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I mean, it's it's good to pay taxes. Um, it's quite important for the taxes and the inland revenue to be earning um, some um, sort of income. But my position here is the people will keep dodging the taxes so long as they think that the money is not being used to their benefit. That's what I'm thinking. Um, because if they see something tangible being that the money is being used for, then when they are paying their taxes, then they don't feel that they're losing money. But when they pay the taxes and they don't see anything tangible happening, that's when they tend to feel that maybe you know, uh, this money is going into an empty coffer and so I don't want to be part of it. So they try and avoid it as much as possible. That's the reason why I was asking these questions. But we we'll probably along the line from some of the questions, maybe you'll be able to explain a bit better. So we can move on. Um, I think I see it from two angles. Yes, part of that part, that part is there, that part of your story is there. But the last side, I think uh, in Canada here in particular, right from independence, you have been used to government doing everything for you. So people think the government should be doing it. They don't see why they should contribute. So that part, I would say, uh, our tax education has not gone down very well with the, with the people on the ground. Because basically, right from government government's time, everything was government, government. You know, we started with socialist, socialist mentality. Like government provided everything. So it's not that we are going deep democratic. And 
people should feel it. They should know that everybody should contribute to make the turn economy around. You see, that is what uh, our education should go that deep for them to appreciate it. Otherwise, everybody thinks government should come, to, government should come and do it. So the government doesn't do it. They saw the government or won't vote for you and things like that. You see, they don't see that it's their money they should use to, to help the nation to develop. That is one. So we talk about the education part. That's, the other one, the second part is that even the money that we collect is insignificant. I'm seriously, we are uh, compared to, it's, it's not too, like, let me put it that way. I won't say it's insignificant. It is significant in Ghana, but it, it's not big enough to turn the economy around. I used to compare Ghana to the UK. I mean, 19, 2016, the UK collected as much as 550 billion pounds sterling as taxes. That you know that we are in the process now. 2016 in Ghana here, what we collected was equivalent to 5.5 billion, which is one percent of the UK. So you see the difference in economic might. How many things can we do now? 2018, the UK collected something around 690 billion. We are around the same one percent comparatively. I mean, as I, if you compare the, the 2018 figures, it's about the same one percent. So we see a big difference now. We are talking of roads. We are, we are, it said we have 72,000 kilometers of motorable roads in Ghana. And the minister claims only 23% is tired, it's, it's a bit uh, bituminous, yeah. asphalted. That's about a quarter of it. So we are talking about 56,000 or so kilometers on tired, or not asphalted. Some of them have this surface uh, dressing type of quota, but not necessarily asphalted. Now, 56,000 a, a, a kilometer, you have to use about a million dollars for one kilometer to asphalt one kilometer. So, you're talking about, about 56 billion dollars. I mean, comparatively, that is huge. That's almost the whole uh, GDP. So, wow. uh, the taxes are uh, co compared to what we have to do, the taxes are not much for the government to construct all the rules, infrastructure, provide infrastructure for people that, yes, we have it, therefore, we pay tax. So, people still have to be convinced. That let's contribute a lot as we go along, things will keep on improving. But we also know that um, it's not simply the revenue from the tax that is going to do all these things. You get uh, income from, from outside as well. You get some, some help from outside to do all this because our, our economy isn't, isn't robust enough for our tax to be able to do all the things that we need it to do. So even if you were collecting the full maximum of tax, you still wouldn't be able to do um, as much as, for example, UK could do collecting the full maximum of tax because our economy isn't robust enough. So we get aid from other, other sources to help us do that. But then also people feel that a lot of the money goes into other people's pockets. That's why we haven't been able to do a fraction of what we need to do. That's also a reality. We, we all know that we have to pay taxes, wow. but we also know that the economy isn't robust enough to enable all our taxes to do all the things that they need to do. So by all means, we need some help from somewhere. But so people also aren't confident mm -hmm. that when they pay the taxes, it's going to go and do the things that it's supposed to do. I'm sure some of them feel that if I pay my tax, am I going to somebody else's pocket? What guarantees do I have that when I pay my tax, it's going to, to tire the road, it's going to provide a school for my community, it's going to provide you know, public toilets for me. What, what, what guarantees do they have? They don't. I believe that is highly exaggerated. I believe a lot of the money goes actually goes into infrastructure development. If you look at um, the spencer pattern, a lot of them uh, go into career development. A few, a few is definitely uh, I'll call it. Uh, there'll be a seepage somewhere along the line. I mean, we don't don't rule that out. But uh, looking at our revenue, the general national revenue, the bigger point point to be the tax. In fact, the others are uh, donors, donor sponsorship and loans. Basically, the government goes into loans, foreign loans and like euro bonds and then uh, this uh, uh, local bonds you see, to top up, to make up for the, the revenue shortfall. But basically, that's, after, at the end of the day, we still use the tax money in paying the loans or servicing the loans. So it still doesn't help. It's like uh, we keep on run, running fast enough to be at, in order to be at the same place. But we do get revenue from our oil and, and things as well, our, our cocoa and all that. We do get money from that. So it's not simply from the, from the taxes. Mm -hmm. But then I think that people, as Theo mm -hmm. was saying, people need to be educated. And there's got, there's got to be some element of transparency for them to know that so that they can, mm -hmm. there's a correlation between the tax I'm paying and, and, and the services I'm getting. So if there's some sort of transparency, people are able to understand that and say from, 
my I pay my taxes, therefore I'm getting this, then they'll be more they'll be more inclined to pay taxes. Do you see what I mean? So maybe you've got to make it more transparent for them. Okay. I understand you. I get you. That's my view as, as an ordinary person, not a tax expert. Yeah, yeah, you are right. You are right. It's, 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 it's understandable that we're not generating enough income to be able to redevelop um, quick enough. Um, it's also understandable that maybe our resources are not being developed quick enough to be able to gain the full benefits um, in terms of um, um, revenues um, from minerals, gold, cocoa, and hence we really appreciate the new government that is uh, pushing um, for Ghana Beyond Aid and also mm -hmm. pushing to ensure you guys are doing such a wonderful job out there. Um, it's amazing. From what you've just disclosed to us, of course, we're not um, generating enough income. So um, you're managing with the little that we have. Um, I think the key issue here is education, 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 as well as um, looking into facilities that would help um, the businesses grow quicker. Um, in terms of um, their working standards, um, the areas that they work. Um, if you look at things like the market sellers, are you providing anything for them to be able to work comfortably? For example, market stalls, anything like that? Just last week, uh, it was announced that they've completed the Kumase uh, market, KDT market. Right. It is, it is, it is, it is, I wish I wish we see the beauty of it. Oh, very wow. massive, very large, and well, very, very beautiful. I mean, provided with every facility, hospitals, uh, children's, uh, for the children, uh, uh, children to take their children to school, uh, hospital, uh, police station, uh, sanitation facilities, everything. I mean, that, 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 that uh, fits a modern market. And once in a while, the government constructs markets. See, it's all part of uh, government infrastructure. Markets are consulted, schools are consulted, hospitals are consulted for the people. So they should appreciate the value of the, the usage of the uh, unquote, of the tax money. So, so you've got to link this to the tax. They, you've got to link this to the tax then, so that they know that it's the tax I'm paying that is helping do all these things. Yes, exactly. Because people should be yeah, aware. So of maybe maybe they're, the, they're, they're the commission. I wish they would invite tax men to to use that as a, a, a tax education platform to to for the women to appreciate why. That beautiful edifice is standing there for them to use. I, I mean, at the end of the day, we are all aware that for any country to be um, to gain better standards of living, is the small businesses that help a lot because they are the ones that generate jobs for people to join in. They also recycle the money in the system, um, whereby they pay the taxes, mm -hmm. it comes back, and then is re is reused to even make things better. They also gain money to be able to regenerate their businesses, expansion, and uh, things like that. Um, for them to be able to do that, they need to be given the facilities to work with. Um, so, I mean, this is generally something that has to be told and to be shown and to be um, introduced. Probably you need to do a little bit more advertising for people to realize that, look, this is what we're using your tax, your money for. And the idea is for us to be able to work together with you so that you'll be able to you know expand in your business and also to be able to go further so that we can also work um, employ people um, and, and and generate the, the whole economy so i think it's it's, it's something that um, you, you need to put forward and um, to be able to inform um, the authorities and, um, and for them to be able to advertise and tell people and to also expand um, and the education system in Ghana so that people appreciate what is actually happening and what you, your, your hard work is. So excellent. Very good. So the next question is, is an international tax consultant firm, KPMG, has identified tax policies which are currently derailing the smooth running of businesses in the country. The policies included the decoupling of the um, GET fund and NHIL levy from um, VAT. 
the luxury vehicle levy mm -hmm. and the extension of national fiscal stabilization levy. The, result, the rest are letters of credit for bonded warehousing, non-deductibility of VAT on imports by companies, tax stamp policy, tax reconciliation by employers, and high interest rate. Is the question clear? Yeah, yeah, very loaded. Very loaded. But let's pick it one by one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the decoupling of uh, get fund and any help from VAT, that, uh, uh, it was created as a levy. That came in the mid-year budget of the finance minister last year. Um, basically, it was to plug a revenue shortfall. I mean, it was a revenue shortfall and he bought it in as a kept the VAT at 12 and a half and then bought that as a levy specifically to be paid by everybody. So even if you have credit, you still pay. If whatever, and it was supposed to, and it actually did help because uh, it it raised the VAT revenue for almost a third, and that was good. So it really did well for the nation. Um, saying it is affecting businesses, but, um yes initially but i think now people are used to it and it's a it's a it may be subject to review when things improve when because it was brought in people to to block a loophole so once that loophole is blocked and the and the, and the, and the revenue is on an even kill i believe uh, the minister can decide to withdraw that particular type of tax just to let people operate freely um the other one was um, letters of credit for bonded warehouse. It's a, it's a, a size tax policy or something. A size tax policy. A size tax stamp was um, was was brought in to uh, work on uh, what do you call it? Carbonated drinks, beer, milk, stout. Uh, water packets and others. Um, that one was to help in uh, stop people from smuggling those items, cigarettes and others. People were smuggling those things inside see, and sell alongside a normal and it's affecting traders. So this one is even helping traders because I have a, a tobacco trader who happily came to tell me that his sales have shot up by 50% because the small gold ones cannot come in any longer. Because unless you have the sticker, it will be seized and bent. So people are afraid to bring those ones in. You see? And you can't smuggle in. Otherwise, you have to pass over. When you pass over, they will pay duty. No one ready to pay. Because otherwise, the price will shoot up into not worth bringing it in. So significantly, it has killed and ill. Uh, the luxury car, I think it's a bit of a misnomer in the sense that... Uh, We're looking at a lot of private cars, big land cruiser and others. We're all on the streets, especially those of us uh, in Kumasi. Every weekend during funerals, people bring those cars, they hire it. People hire those cars in Accra and make it. And because the cars have been licensed as private cars, it's easy for them to come in. See, it's easy for nobody, and, but they actually charge the people on the quiet and nobody pays tax on them. So now, you are you are you are you are forced to pay something at the DVLA before you even pick the car. Now, what's happening is that now most of them are shifting into turning their cars into commercial. You now in Ghana, the, the the plates, the number of plate is white when you run a private car. When it's commercial, it's yellow. And the white cars go to DVLA once in a year, but the yellow commercial ones go to DVLA twice a year. So people don't like going there twice a year for all the checks and whatever. To go through the process all over again, to go to the motions. So people prefer private cars. But this were people who are using private car privately, quietly, one notice, and they were still commercializing it. So now we are forced to go commercial, and that is good for us. Do uh, LC on uh, letters of credit on bonded warehouses is to help an audit trail. Uh, people 
those on suspense regime, the customs, those who bring in goods, some people keep it in bonded warehouses so that they can pay the duty as and when they, they pull out the goods to come and sell. See, when you don't have enough money, when you put so much like a container full of goods, you don't have enough money to pay all the duty. You are allowed to keep it in a bonded warehouse with custom padlocks. So whenever you want to take out, they go and open for you, then you can take it out, you pay the duty on it and take it out and sell. Now you are supposed to ensure the, the warehouse itself, you're supposed to ensure the goods. In addition, most people are doing, um, uh, some people are not passing money to the banking system. Some people are doing uh, money laundering. So now everybody's being pushed into a banking system, the letter of credit. So now you have to, so through the letter of credit, at least we can know how much the real cost is. We are trying to establish because people do over and under invoicing and we are trying to cure all these ills. So invariably, going to the banks, people do not like going to the banks and that's what they are claiming is the selling their business. But it's a good way to get things straightened up. And then you're also talking about non durability of VAT and imports. In fact, the VAT law does not say, uh, it does not even mention importers at all. The VAT law says wholesalers and retailers are su supposed to use the VAT flat scheme, which is a 3%. In the 3%, you don't claim any input. And some importers are also uh, wholesalers and retailers. That's why they are coming. But those who are not wholesalers and retailers, they don't have a problem. But it do not affect them in any way. Any other one? It's a tax reconciliation by employers. Tax reconciliation what by employers. That? And then, then I think high interest rate. High interest rate. Is that it? High interest yeah. rate, yes. High interest rate, yes. Um, currently, uh, the Bank of Ghana policy rates are 60%. If I use to 25.5% until uh, 2017, when uh, it started coming down and uh, due to a little discipline in the macroeconomic environment, it started coming down. Now it's about 16%. And the bankers normally put 8 to 9% margin on it before they loan it out to the public. Now, significantly, it is expensive because uh, I learned Côte d'Ivoire, Côte d'Ivoire, the interest rate in Côte d'Ivoire is about 7%. And then they have, they have this French front backing. So their currency is a bit stable. Now, if you go to China, I learned it's about 2% or so, and most of you below that. And so the average Ghanaian producer and manufacturer has a competitive disadvantage in competing with some of these manufactured goods from Côte d'Ivoire, from, uh, from China and others. That's two examples like China and Côte d'Ivoire. I mean, naturally, if somebody is getting 7% to manufacture and you are taking 25 to 33%, it's, it's, it's way back expensive. So yes, interest interest rate is not the best, but gradually, I think as the macroeconomic distance stabilizes, the bank will be reducing the policy rate and gradually it will come down. So um, it's it's an ongoing process, and I believe in a few years or so, few months or a few years, there will be significant drops, and then gradually the banks can also come down on their lending rates, and the business can flourish properly. So why 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 are the interest rates so high? You know it. It depends on the economy. The economy, the macroeconomic indicators are not, we're not favorable. Mm. Uh, the Bank of Ghana has to balance of so that it doesn't cause inflation. And they look at so many money, money supply. They look at so many factors in determining what is their policy rate. So if they take it at the Bank of Ghana at 20%, definitely the banks will give it a report at 30% mm. or mm. more. But as it drops down, it reduces. So now most loans are around 24, 25. They are gradually coming down. In the last at 2016, some of them were as high as 35%. Oh. Now it has dropped down by about 10% to about 25%. So gradually it is coming down. And it makes business business people more comfortable that way if it drops oh. down. So gradually it will come. How do you work with 35% interest? Madness. It, is That's about it was really about terrible. About Oh, but gradually yeah. it's coming down. I believe, I believe in no lesser time we will have a good good rates for to for business to flourish. I think that is basically to me that is the biggest bane of business people. Yeah. The interest rate from the bank. It's, it's just it's just astronomical. We have a quick question from some of uh, the members on the forum, and one of the questions okay. which has just come about because we are discussing that now um, is the question says is 
are there any thoughts on impact of withholding taxes on small businesses where SMEs, which is, I, I think, small to medium enterprises, never get certificates and are uncertain if these deductions are being made to government? Is there an intent to reform this area so that um, small to medium enterprises can get appropriate rec recognition of the cash deducted against any tax payments due? So, I yes. think. Yes. Yeah. Formerly, we used to uh, write. So, sometimes people will pay and they'll tell you to come in a month time for the because it's serious. But now, everything is fast. I mean, once you pay in immediately, the, the receipt is generated. So people normally don't even go for their receipts. If I have the way to go to tax office, they can see the receipts. There are some pile of who don't come for them. They've done taxes once you pay immediately, the receipts generated. That's a beautiful red, yellow, green color like a Ghana flag. Beautiful. And it's easy to go for it. And once you get it, you should use it as part payment of your taxes. Some could not go for it because they don't want you to know how much. Because if they sell one big item to somebody, they don't want you to know that that has gone. Uh, because it will mean you can gross it up to realize the real income, the real uh, turnover. Right. So maybe he had declared something less. He doesn't want to, so they don't want to go for it. But once you go, once you, because it is, it is, it is, it's a payment on account. So you should quickly go for it, and you should defray your, your, your debts. Most people don't even know. That's why. And I, I learned at the port some time back. You get one uh, ta, uh, what you call it, crane agent, who work on. Uh, maybe one container, syndicated container, where maybe there are about 10 people's items inside. He will clear it in his name and take the one thousand, go and use it to pay his taxes. And the members don't know, so they use it, they, they add it to their cost. So now most of them should know that they should break the, the, the bonds down. I mean, if you break bulk, break down for everyone to clear individually, then that helps. Like this payment system is bringing about, you see, if everybody clears on its own, then you take the one tax now you pay at the pot to yourself. Then you use it to defer your, your debt. I think it's still about education. That's what is keeping most of these SMEs in trouble. But gradually, they will, they, will, they will know it. We are trying to create something using cloud technology. Right. Uh, where very soon, it will be in between them, in between the, 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 the buyer and the seller. So they shoot, they shoot, we shoot between them, not necessarily at the tax office. But we can monitor it. It's something that is in the pipeline. We are working on it and one day to come. And they will not need to come to us. Some people are even afraid of the name tax office. They don't want to go there. You see, so if they don't want to go there, then they should do it between themselves and let's have it. I think that's what we are working on. So that one will come using cloud technology. It will come very soon. Oh, so can you explain that cloud technology or the new technology that you're saying um, that is being looked into and would, would be introduced? How is that going to work? Yes. Um, It's some form of uh, withholding tax agency right. where the seller felt uh, after deducting the five percent or seven and a half, whatever percentage that's on it, as means five percent, then uh, you pay with 90 maybe you pay what do you call it? The buyer will pay with uh, two checks, the 95 percent for the real payment, and five percent that should go to the so um. So basically, the tax is collected straight away when a transaction takes place, rather than after the transaction is taken. The seller, the seller will give you your your receipt for ninety five percent and give you the five percent for the uh, GRA. Right. The seller will give you that the, the two receipts to signify that I've taken five percent. This one is going to GRA. So GRA, then the person now will have to account to GRA, and this one is given to particular institutions that have to do that. So that we can easily monitor them, and those people have the technology to do it. Oh, okay. It's so not yet in. Yeah, still working. Anytime, so anytime a trader buys, when it comes, anytime a trader buys an item, he gets on it on the receipt. Um, it has a separate invoice for taxes and a separate invoice for the actual item. That, so that at is, the end of that the, is, that the, that you can add all the items up knowing that this is how much i have to give back to the VR, gra is that is that what you're saying that, that is that is if it attracts voting tax not every child attracts voting tax. when it's your stock in trade it doesn't attract voting tax but if it's a third party transaction for example if you are running a commercial business and you have you are paying something to your lawyer to your accountant to your auditor 
You see, those are third party transactions. It's not part of your normal trade. You see, that one you're not for foreign tax. Now you may deduct it. You see, so instead of giving the receipt, you give two receipts to the person. Normally, you take the money and come and pay to GRA before you get a receipt, before you go and give it to a person. Now you can give the two receipts to the person, so the person can use that to come and claim his tax. Uh, then you account for it to the tax office. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Uh, that's what we are trying to work with. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good. Um, the next question is that um, the, in, in, the informal sector has been advised to register for their tax identification number because without that, they could not transact business with the Registered General's Department passport office, the courts, and other such institutions. How can Ghanaians mm -hmm. in the diaspora register for the TIN? The TIN. Uh, we have to, four identities that you have to use for, to register for TIN. One is your driving license. The other is uh, your national identification card. And the third one is uh, your passport. And then I think the voters' ID card, four of them. Now, those outside may mainly use their, their, their passport. That's the bio data page of your passport. You do a colored photocopy of that one. And then you can use that, fill the form, give it to any task office. And within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you have your certificate. Otherwise, you can file it online. Now, you, an, an officer will pick it, and then you send you a PDF. Then you can print your certificates wherever you find yourself. Because somebody must authenticate it before you are giving the order to print. When you fill it, you can't print. Somebody in a task office must authenticate it or call, uh, call it. approve it before then you send the PDF, then you can print the certificate at wherever you find yourself. So when you talk about Some the price... So when you talk about a passport, you clearly mean a Ghanaian passport. But not, not every Ghanaian in the diaspora has a Ghanaian passport. No, no, no. You can, you can use your whatever passport, the it's bio data page of your passport. Right. So whatever part, and it doesn't matter which passport. No, no, so no. no. If it's a British passport, passport. So Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. How are people monitored to ensure they pay their taxes? With the tin, yeah, with the tin, yeah. That's um, all. The database, the database is being constructed, and very soon it will be easy to know everybody's task position. Now, the original idea is only tin, but it is going to be consolidated into a Ghana card, the national ID card, where you have your uh, social security number, you have your driving license number, you have your tin. You have your bank account and I think six different voters ID card and six different uh, items will go on the card, just like you do at your end. I mean, so once anybody starts it in, you can see everything at a glance. Now, this is also good for security purposes. So that, uh, I mean, in terms, uh, in terms of checking terrorists and others, you can know who is what. You have nobody to also use different identities and different ages and so many things and different documentation. This, there must be uniformity. So the Ghana card is basically the end product of some of these things. So at the end, everybody will have a Ghana card, which will have your, all those bio data inside. So it's easy to track every single person who is moving about and how you go about your work and your transactions can be monitored. And the next one is GRA's communication systems network, I suppose, network with the passport office, register general department, the course and other various government departments. Yes, the, we, are, we have. Yeah, we are, we are, we have linked the, data, the databases of all those issues, the passport office, uh, register general, uh, uh, the electoral commission, the driving vehicle licenses, and the, whatever, whatever, the national identification authority. We are we we are linked to all those places, so that whenever you fail your thing, we can cross check it. It's not easy to hide. I mean, that's why we need authentication because when they write some doc, uh, some some information are not linking together, then they, they, they make you go and do the right thing. So that's the difference. So basically, we are networked to all those. We are we are we have we are hooked to their databases. We can cross check 
the information you are giving us so nobody can tell us. And, and the last thing that I forgot to tell you is that you must also know your mother's maiden name. This part of the thing that you're going to fill on the tin, the tin form, your mother's maiden name. Some people's names, uh, uh, you can have like Tio Ellis in, in the UK, you can have another Tio Ellis in Ghana. You see, the difference is that maybe their mothers are different. It's not because if it's a family name, the Ellis will be the father is called Mr. Ellis. Definitely, or the, if you say father's name, then the, this one will have Mr. Ellis and Mr. Ellis. But as for the mother's maiden names, my differ. So it's it will it, it be rare to coincide. That's the way we identify two different people from each other. When a name pops up, another name pops up, maybe six of them, then we have to differentiate between them. So your maid, your mother's maiden name is what we differentiate you from all others. So anybody who wants to fill the thing for us also know your mother's maiden name. Gosh, what if you don't know? What if you don't have that information? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seems that everybody everybody has this information. What if you don't? What so happens? Your grandmother, or your grandmother is dead. No, this is, this is uh, a serious question I'm asking. Your grandmother is dead. You know, you don't have any contact yeah. with anybody else. How mm. do you? I suppose ninety nine percent of people can tell their their mother's maiden names. <laughs> and how do you then? Okay, because anybody can make up a name. I can tell you my mother's middle name is whatever. How will you check it? It can be any name. What it what it means is that when, when somebody else with another name, the maiden the, the mother's middle name are not coincide with yours. So we you know who your 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 mother's is. So you can just make up a name and understand. No, as you make a name that your mother is called Techiwa. It doesn't what it matter. What means that uh, 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 Barbara's mother's name is Techiwa. So it's yeah. attached. Somebody maybe if you talk about Brahmansa, Anna Brahmansa also comes. Her mother is uh, Asantua. Anna Brahmansa can the mother is Tewa. You see, so then they don't coincide. So we can identify each and every one. Once so you go into your your yours will pop up, so you can know who you are dealing with. So it doesn't matter. Um, but it's it's good to tell the truth that to lie. Because one day you need to pop up and you'll be in trouble. So but it doesn't really matter what your mother if you don't know, you can just put any name down then, don't can't you? Because who's going to check? The, the the main thing is that you're you're, you're trying to differentiate between no, no, so I'm saying, as we, as we run the trouble tomorrow what happens and that pops up and your mother's name is not that you are what happens but if nobody knows if then nobody that, knows, that's where you're going to trouble but if nobody knows what my mother's maiden name is i don't know and i'm just guessing you can pick a name from your family line or whatever something that will that will be that's that will better than just to say anything because you might not remember one day when they call you and ask what's your mother's your mother's maiden name you made something else and realize that you are telling lies at the beginning, then you can't nobody can even trust you to start with. That's what I'm saying. One day you can run trouble by telling lies. It's always good to tell the truth. If you don't know your mother's name, maybe your mother, your auntie, or somebody who is close, you can use that to be sure you are covered. Maybe. So that yeah, when, when you are getting when you get in trouble, you can remember that name. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it's, it's this just a, 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 it's not real. It's just a canonical yeah. argument. So, yeah, we'll leave that. that. But I just, you know, I'm just worried about those who yeah. don't know. Or, um, my, my worry is when you have foreigners trying to, uh, you know, um, trying to, you know, um, create identities as Ghanaians. Um, that's where my worry is. Um, how easy is it for a non ghanaian to apply for Ghanaian citizenship and or tin or any of these? The national ID card. I knew there were separate ones for foreigners. You can apply as a foreigner, I can apply as a Ghanaian. So if you're a foreigner and you don't want to be, you, you are not supposed to be a Ghanaian, you are a foreigner, apply as a foreigner. They, we, you are identified as a foreigner of your ID card, you are sick of it. I think it means those foreigners who it's want foreign. to, who want That's to. say you're not a Ghanaian, later, later immigration pops up and you get into trouble and then you are not a Ghanaian. To, for forging your documents, it means you are, you are already heading towards jail. See, it's not the best. I mean, assuming they come up, something happens, you get into trouble, and immigration is pick up that this one is a Ghanaian, it's not a Ghanaian, and all other documents pop up and you are not. What happens? It means you are putting yourself into trouble. Yeah. So once you have a room to operate that you can register as a Ghanaian or as a non Ghanaian, you don't have a problem. Just register as a non Ghanaian, have a peace of mind. But I suppose those, if there's going to be any tampering with the system, it's going to be. In the my very very a very very tiny tiny number. That's it, that's yeah, it, very. It. Yeah. It's a key to why it's, it's a 
And also, so we can track about, everybody so that we don't have business coming in to as tourists. How about Ghanaians who haven't, um, who are using or who have um, foreign passports? It doesn't matter, he said. He says that you can use whatever passport. In China, we have, we have dual, dual citizens. People can be Ghanaians and other countries. Some of, a lot of people over there are both British and Ghanaians at the same time. We are comfortable with that. We don't have a problem. At least we know you have double passport and we are comfortable with that. No, so if so I you can I, choose to do what, what you want. If I don't have a, because I asked you, if I don't have a Ghanaian passport, I only have a British passport. You said that I could do the TIN with a British passport, the team with a British passport. Yeah, you state whatever. The point, the most point is, is to tell the truth. Just advance your arguments, put the real facts on the ground. We will handle you nicely that way. No, but that, if you want to miss up information, then that's what you want. no, no, no. I just want to know that can I apply for a, a, no, a no, with no, a no, British passport? No, you can't. Why not? Ghanaians okay. outside are applying. We allow them to. Um, I think the issue here will be is there are there any tax differences for foreign businesses and Ghanaian businesses? Therefore, if a director of a company or a CEO of a company of a business in Ghana but hasn't got a Ghanaian passport, would he be seen as a foreign entity and because of that be paying more taxes or? Is it a flat rate that everybody pays? We have different rates according to which particular tax we are working on. If it's registered as a, a resident company, it's different. When it's a non-resident company, tax are also different. And if you're a non-resident company and we have double tax agreement with you, then there's a way of working out that tax too. No, we have double tax agreement with a lot of countries like Britain, Netherlands, South Africa, and other countries. So even the tax that we implement, the rate is different. It's lower than that. Because we assume you're also going to pay tax in your country. So we net off some part of it for you to be comfortable. So we are not double taxed. No, what it's I mean, a way of uh, working that way. A business in Ghana, or if you're trying to set up a business in Ghana, um, for example, myself, I hold a British passport and I want to come and set up a business in Ghana. And because of that, when I did my thing or I registered myself, I'm seen as a British citizen, although I'm Ghanaian. Will that mm -hmm. affect my tax um, deductions in terms of how much I'm taxed? Because I'm see because a British a citizen can also come in to set up a business, and because he's British and he set up a business, he's seen as a foreign person, so his taxes might be higher or might be lower. What are the differences, and do we, um, uh, how do we avoid that if it's possible? That's what I'm trying to say. Our difference is resident and non-resident. It's not necessarily in your nationality, whether you are resident here or you are non-resident. So if you stay in the country the whole of this year, you are resident. We have ways of working such situations. You coming in at very British part, you can come in as a British citizen and come and up as a British citizen, run a company. If the company is a British company coming to with a branch in Ghana, it's considered differently. So right. But if you come and set up, you are coming. That's what I'm saying. You can also have a dual citizenship. If you're a Ghanaian, then if you come and set as a Ghanaian, then it's also different. It's not the same thing. But it so, depends on the number of times so, you see the country and all that. So if, if um, the, the, it's, it's, not a, it's not a straightforward policy, it depends on so many factors that will come into your tax system. Mm. Is that the yeah, I only Man, you know. because of people in the diaspora, people from different countries, Guineans from different countries with different circumstances um, in terms of their identity, so that they can understand where they stand in case they intend to have a business in Africa or in Ghana, let's say. Um, next question is, what are the tax yeah, incentives? You, were you saying something, Sam? Yeah, I was talking about that very soon. I mean, you know, this uh, information, you know, that's going to come. The Americans started with the FATCA, I don't know if it, the Foreign Accounts uh, Tax Compliance Act. So some years ago, Americans bought what they call the FATCA. And that is uh, all American citizens everywhere must be taxed and bought to America. So now they were the first every country to account for whoever is in their country through the banking system. Um, what happens if you don't comply? Then the dollar is the medium of exchange of almost every transaction in, in world trade. So everybody pass, everybody banks pass through a correspondent bank in America. 
So whenever your money ready, they will take 30%. So every country was forced to comply. The only countries which uh, delayed or refused to cooperate initially was Switzerland and Japan because of their secrecy. But they were forced. I mean, Americans gave them only six months, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, just brief, six months briefing space and you have to comply. And they have to. Now, in the, in the EEC and the OEC, this one is different. That's actually information. And that is starting this year. Too. And that one, the British can request for British citizens in Ghana. There are taxes that you pay to them. And then Ghana can request for Ghana citizens outside to pay to them. These are things that are coming to me. I told you, I don't mean that. Now, Ghana's tax system, formerly used to be uh, the jurisdiction was only those in Ghana, or those who work in Ghana. Now, it is worldwide. So, a time will come, Ghanaians outside will find a way to tax them. That's the system that's coming to be in the world. The EEC, OECD model. It's, it's an actual information system, and that's going to come very soon. And that brings a quick question. Um, because so, so saw... that comes into so, so then when you migrate here, all those who work into it, you see how best you, you fit into the system. What advantages would that be to someone that lives abroad and is coming back home? What advantages does that have for that person? I think, I think, I think it is all part of um, trying to make sure you are not double taxed. You can be taxed in Ghana and taxed over there, but you have to find a way to unify so that you are taxed at one and so that you don't pay your taxes. To the individual, I'm sure it will be an advantage. But those who are hiding it to be a disadvantage. Right. Excellent. Um, recently, we heard on the news that they were going to start taxing people um, uh, who have properties abroad and probably lo or that live abroad and have properties in Ghana. Is that similar to what we've just discussed? All these are in the pipeline, but not concrete yet. So I can't uh, talk much about it. They were all proposed, but they haven't been, uh, um, they haven't rolled out yet. It's still under discussion. Let's we'll see what happens. By the time we talk about buildings, so for those with beautiful buildings at East Lagoon others, what is their income? What I mean, those things once go because now you have a setup of a high net worth group office in our ta tax office, high net worth mm -hmm. to classify those who are up to a certain uh, those in a certain category. And then similarly, that came into the car system. You see, this car, those with luxurious cars. So uh, uh, tax is, is their policies, and policies are supposed either to cure some ills or to rope in some income. So uh, they, I think they have to find things say that it doesn't catch so many people in crossfire. That will create problems for people. That's why maybe some of these have not been ruled out yet. I think they have to be sure it is um, it is getting to the right people. It doesn't disturb others who are actually caught in crossfire. That's why these things haven't come out. But gradually, some of these things in the future will come out. Um, the next question is, what are the tax incentives offered by the government under the general tax relief policy to businesses in Ghana? Um, for example, we have something called young entrepreneurs. That is those who are 35 years and below. If you're a young man, you want to set up business. We want to encourage a lot of young people who are creative and innovative to set up businesses. Especially in sectors like manufacturing, information, information and communication technology, agro processing, energy production, waste processing, and tourism and creative arts. What we do to you is that we allow you to have the first five years as tax free. You'll be on tax holiday for the first five years of your operation. Then from there, we start taxing you. That is one. And then, if you want to set up a manufacturing industry uh, outside Accra Tama, you know, Accra Tama is a capital and it's like oh, a lot of industries are here. So, we put to push inland to develop the rest of the country. So, if you push yours in any of the regional capitals outside Accra, you, you, you are giving uh, the corporate tax rate in Ghana is 25%. So then you take 75% of the rate of the corporate tax income, or if any, that is appropriate to you. You take the 75% of the 25%, which means that you're paying about 18.75, something like that. And if you are outside elsewhere, any of the original capitals, and you place your factory elsewhere, then you are paying. 50% uh, of the corporate tax rate, which is 25%, of 50% of 25%, which is about 12.5%. So why those like that are paying 25%, you will pay 12.5%. That is encouraged people to set up industry in the rural areas. Now, if you employ a graduate to, uh, 
we are giving, uh, for example, if your employer graduates up to 1%, 10% of your salaries are allowed as a, as a, as a deduction, as an expenditure. Uh, if it's between 1% and 5%, 30%, then if you employ about 5% of your, if your, your employees, 5% of them are newly employed graduates, then 50% of their salaries are allowed as a deductible expenditure. It is to help people to employ new graduates, as many people as possible, so that we reduce the employment level in the country. And then if you enter the, the agro-processing or cocoa, cocoa processing sector, we, we, um, you are, you are, you pay, those who set up agro-processing sectors in the character, you pay about 15%. As tax, if you pay in the regional capitals outside the uh, savannah region, you pay 12 and a half percent. If you set up in the other regional capitals, 10 percent, and if you set up in the savannah region, 5 percent, only 5 percent tax. Or your uh, income less expense, whatever you come up, only 5 percent is tax. We just want to create more people to go into agro processing and food processing and things like that. The last question is, um, what are the tax incentives and free zone areas offered by the government under the general tax relief policy to entice foreign investments and business development in Ghana? Um, you are giving 100% exemption from direct and indirect duties and for your production. And what about you for export, like packaging and all that for export, 100%. Uh, you, are, you are not supposed to pay anything. And then um, income tax on your profit for 10 years. If you are exporting 70% of the items, and then 30, if you're 30%, that's not less than 70%. You can export 70% and 30% in the pay market. You are allowed to do that. Then after 10 years, then you move to 15%. And it's a gift. You don't pay the same corporate as 25% like others pay. You pay 15% now. Now you also are only from dividends and you won't tax on dividends. It's a dividend tax. You are exempted from paying tax on them. Uh, double taxation agreement, you are exempted. Um, minimal customer customs formalities. Basically, 100% uh, ownership of shares by foreigners are allowed. Why in some institutions, maybe some of them, we have to be, uh, they have a local content. But when you're in the free zone, you are allowed as a foreigner to invest 100% agriculture, 100% ownership of shares, you are allowed. And you can repatriate your money any anytime you want to. So your capital, your dividend, your profit, whatever, you have the right to, to repatriate it. And you are allowed to operate a foreign bank account in Ghana banks. The dollar account, euro account, pound sterling account, you are allowed to do it. So if you want to repatriate your money, it's easy to do it. Just follow Bank of Ghana regulations and you are. So those are all things that are used to help you. And nobody can nationalize your, 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 your investment. It's all part of the law to, 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 to make you double assured that your investment is yours and nobody will take it. Just to, just help the Ghana economy and let us move forward. That's it. So it will help the economy by um, providing jobs. Yes. And the workers will pay tax. Yes. And... Um, or the bottom of goods and services they, they provide to enhance the, the, the economy. Is that, is that the benefit you're going to be getting? That's it. Because they're getting, they're getting so much relief. Yeah. We, we just want to attract so many people into the free zones for them to, for us to have a lot of industries, a lot of people to work. Yeah. Okay. And once they work, we'll, we'll get our, our pay as we earn from the workers. The issue with and, that. And, and, there, and there will be products, a lot of products for sale on the market. And will benefit from it in the long run. Okay. I mean, I'm presuming these are the assumptions in terms of people coming in and setting up businesses here. You can take away, repatriate all your money, um, close down the business at any time. Um, you're given free areas that you can operate in, um, which is excellent ideas um, in terms of trying to regenerate the economy and bring in businesses. But how do we monitor these businesses that are being set up, these new businesses that are being set up, um, taking into consideration um, uh, these small miners that um, came in called the Galamse and started um, destroying our natural resources? How do we monitor them and regulate them? Oh, there are, are officers, there are, are, are inspectors, specific inspectors from the export, uh, Ghana Free Zone Board, who does inspection on their own, they give their reports. GRA itself has staff on the field. 
who monitor all these things. We still go and audit them, even though they are free zone, but we still audit them to check that they are doing the right thing. We still go there all over them. We have some officers, we have audit officers who go on them to check that they are complying with the next regulations. So we monitor them. Galam say, Galam say was a bit illegal and it was just out of order. That's why the president banned it last year or something. 2017, when he came to power, he just banned it to be sure people stop. But it was only, it was not only destroying the environment, it was uh, alcohol. Uh, making the waters dirty. And we were scared a time we can we not have water to drink. Because people were poisoning the water with this. Um, uh, the chemical. Chemicals. These chemicals, they were poisoning the water. So they have to stop them. Now they didn't stop. And now we are putting the small scale miners. They are licensed. You are given a particular concession. The government know your boundaries. You are given a particular concession and you are licensed. So they can monitor you so you don't misbehave. It's not like anybody just digging anywhere. No. It's not the same thing. So that's what they are using to monitor. So we have people who are going to monitor to show all these small miners abide by the rules and regulations. And I think it will be in the interest of the nation. And also, I mean, uh, these are lessons learned from mistakes that we made previously, where we didn't actually monitor and regulate these small scale miners, for example. But the main question is that how much, how do we know about the volume of work? Um, for example, Ghana has recently mentioned the fact that they're getting several billions of. Uh, money from the Chinese to exchange bauxite, for example. We have the expertise to be able to monitor how much bauxite that is being traded across to make sure that they don't exceed the amount that has been estimated to be given to them. You know, you have the precious minerals, uh, precious uh, PMMC, that monitors the, the mineral, the gold and diamond that are taken out. Everybody will have to sell through them. So the government is able to monitor how much comes from the small scale. At the point, they were almost a third of it, 36% at the point in time. That's how much they sell to the state. Apart from the, the big companies, the big companies are about 64%, and the small miners were giving the state as much as 36%. So there's a way of monitoring them. Similarly, the government set up a disc, Ghana Integrated Aluminium Development Corporation. I'm sure they will be on this, this box site uh, to monitor them to make sure that we are producing so much. It's, it's a work of coaching. Bauxite, maybe if you take five tons, it generates so much. It generates so much alumina. I mean, there's there's a way of, into the refinery, there's a way of monitoring it. So definitely those who are thinking, I mean, we, have, we have a lot of, I mean, Ghanian, brilliant Ghanian geologists and uh, whatever, men, 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 metallo metallurgists and all those people who can help. See, so it's going to be difficult for people to monitor. Excellent. They'll find a way to check so that nobody is used. So, Sam, thank you very much. My, my, my Ghanaians are always smart. Don't adore don't the Ghanaian. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite important because we have such... Um, we have resources that the world is looking for. Mm. And yet we have people in the same country that we have resources that the world is looking for who are struggling to even drink clean water. If you look at Obuasi, which you just mentioned, for example, Obuasi has been the main area in Ghana which has been providing gold throughout how many, over 60 years plus? Over the years. And yet when you go to Obuasi today, as we speak, the roads are yeah. filled with potholes, they are untied. The people live as peasants, they are farmers who go into farms and feed them their, their families through hardcore work every day as we speak. Why is this happening? And that's the reason why people are reluctant to be paying taxes, because they don't see the benefits that they are paying the taxes for. So why is this happening today as we speak in Obuasi, for example? Obuasi collapsed some time ago. They, were, they mined for 100 years and then Obuasi collapsed for some time. It's only, I think, only last month that the president went to recommission it. They are restarting work all over again. And he mentioned, he made mention of the same issues. So I'm sure this time uh, they, they will keep an eye on that to be sure. If God, the factory collapsed. The town itself went dead. And everything was in Galam. Everybody was mining everywhere. This illegal mine, which is the Galamsee, was all over the place. 
So that could, have, that could have caused all this mess. But now there's no, there's not much coming from Obuasi for development. So that might affect it. But now that Obuasi Ashanti Gold Force is back, that's AG Anglo Gold Ashanti is back. I believe uh, very soon things will turn around. But talking about um, smuggling and things leaking out, I mean, naturally, uh, definitely there'll be see pages i mean they, they are some of the, the borders are a bit porous so definitely some will leak out there will definitely be a few smugglers but that is everywhere even even almighty britain people still smuggle cigarettes into the country for all security go to america with its all its security people still smuggle drugs into the country so those things people a little a few things seeping out in and out will definitely happen there's no way you have 100 percent security so uh, we will we, we'll take the maximum possible, we we'll do the maximum possible best to get the maximum benefit from it. A few CPGs, we keep on monitoring this, we have to do their work to be sure we get 100% maximum. Excellent. It's good to have you on board. Good to know you are with us. We'll keep monitoring what the tax systems GRA is doing. What reassurances can you give us before we conclude this session? tonight in terms of developing the economy of ghana and bringing ghanaians a better um, standard of living so i think basically ghanaians are eager now to develop their country i see it the, the average ghanaian now so uh, the government is also committed to it and i see uh, bright future for Ghana, that whatever comes in, Ghanaians are going to use it to develop, to make sure. Uh, because if you look at the discipline, IMF themselves were impressed. And now, even with the IMF, we have passed a law to regulate ourselves, and, are, and I'm sure they are going to stick to it. When there's a law, nobody can cross it. See, the government will be forced to, to abide by the law. It means, it shows you how serious the government is, even this fiscal uh, responsibility act. So it means, uh, we want to discipline ourselves and make sure we pull our it's what called the bootstraps, whatever. How do you call how do you say it? So that we 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 are able to turn the economy on. Whatever comes in, the taxes will be used in uh, infrastructure development. Whatever loans they get, they are eager to to do infrastructure development for the country to open up. And this one, this one factory is supposed to help so many people to work, and not only work, but to bring out the products from every single district, every uh, the predominant products that's in every single so that it is utilized for the whole nation. And so that we grow what we need and what we think is necessary for us. And Ghana can move forward. Uh, I remember when one look at some like plantation, oil palm. If I is only the fifth oil palm plantation, remember jump on this, operation feed yourself. That that spirit must come back to us. When we're feeding ourselves and we're not boring and we're, we're not importing any food. You know, and then we set up, I think, four different uh, oil palm at Kwai, uh, uh, then Chifupra, so the North Palm, and the fact that the universe of Dumbanso. Since the Champon left, nobody has done any plantation again. In interestingly, Malaysians came to study oil palm industry here, and now Malaysian is producing so much oil palm that they are leading the world, and they pick the same materials from Ghana here. So that shows you the, the, the gap we have left behind. That's why we are serious about this, uh, going back to the forest, going to uh, produce so much. Rubber, if you look at rubber, we produce so much rubber from the Western region that, that this we are going to France to produce uh, the Michelin tires for France. This is something that has been left on the back banner. There was a time we pick up something called pop and paper in Dabwasi. The plant a plantation was came on when the factory never came on. And that was supposed to produce 25 times paper, the paper that Ghana needs. We still import paper. It is almost all distance must come on board again. And we turn our countries around. So now, trust me, I believe. Whatever money is coming in will be committed. People will be forced the government. I mean, the, the press is on the alert. The right information bill is coming. Uh, the, the, the social media, the youth of today are so eager. The, any, the little mistake you make before you could say that is on the WhatsApp. Nobody has seen the evil you are doing. So people are on the alert. Nobody is on the alert. I believe things are going to change. I can see a bright future. And please, let us see Ghana as like a building that has been constructed. Everybody, wherever you are, just bring a one brick and let's construct Ghana and make and complete the building Ghana and make Ghana great again. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.
<laughs> thank you for that, Sam. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for that reassurance. I'm really happy about that. You've highlighted a few businesses just at the long run, and I think it makes a lot of sense for us to start thinking about coming back home. Um, yes, I'll leave the ending to you, Barbara. Yes, thanks again, Sam. So um, we're all looking forward to a, a better and prosperous Ghana. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for all the hard work you're doing. And we ask for God's blessings for all of us. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Too. God bless all of us. Thank you. So, Business Links Africa, thank you so much to our viewers um, for your time. We hope this was an insightful um, session whereby we learn something new every week from our peers and our experts. Um, we promise to be coming to you every two weeks with something new, something different. If you have any feedback in terms of what we've just, the sessions, can you please let us know? Um, if you're a member, you can send us a message on the forum. If you're not a member, you can also send us a message using the links that has been provided. We hope you enjoy these sessions. Thank you so much to our very own um, Commissioner, Mr. Sam Dodu. For your time this is the second event that we've held the first one was the um, event, um session where we talked about business and entrepreneurial development in ghana opportunities in ghana ghana beyond aid and this second time was it's about the tax system in ghana and um, the um, new tax systems that has been enforced and hopefully for you to get a good understanding if you could watch this video once again and um, so that you can get all the information that you need for your business we hope this will equip you to be able to advance in your uh, personal life your business and also to educate and extend it to other members of your friends and families and thanks for joining once again thanks to barbara also who's been an excellent moderator um, thanks, Barbara, for being there and having your time this evening. Um, we promise to um, bring you some more um, interesting topics later on, and we will be here to host you and also to um, bring you uh, new information. Is there any more concluding um, information that you'd like to relate to our listeners? No, I think that. That's, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.